I can remember like it was yesterday, the night that God spoke to me through the Holy Spirit about going into full-time ministry to be a pastor. I remember I was laying in bed, and April and I were praying, and she falls asleep very quickly. If she gets warm and comfortable, she gone. Like it, me, I kind of lay there. I got the twitches and all. I can't. You ever just lay there, and you're trying to be still, and your body just starts, Ew! okay, maybe not, but me, it's kind of a struggle. Maybe, it's got, maybe they make medicine for that. I, I don't know. Um, but so what would happen is, is we would pray and read at night. We'd pray together and I start praying and then she would fall asleep. So I'd pray her to sleep and then I would have my own private time because some people do it early in the morning. But at this season of my life, late at night worked for me because the morning was like a tool of Satan in my life. I hated the morning. I didn't like getting up early. I wasn't happy about it. And the last thing I was thinking about when I woke up was Jesus. I woke up rebuking the devil for the way I was feeling, for not getting enough sleep because I stayed up too late and I had to be at work extremely early in the morning. I was laying there praying and I felt like the vo there was a voice in my head that says, get on your knees and pray. And I'm like, I'm already praying. That's the devil. The devil's trying to get me out to bed. Isn't it amazing what you would give credit to the devil for? Can I tell you that it's real easy to realize the voice of the devil and the voice of God? The devil's not going to tell you to do anything that's going to humble yourself. The voice of the devil is telling me to stay in bed. The voice of God is saying, hit your knees, biggin. <laughs> and so, I, now that's my paraphrase because I can say that to myself. And, um, and I remember getting on, so I'm laying there, I'm like, Lord, I'm already praying. Can I be a pillow prophet? Can I be, I'm just like kind of, just kind of working away. It's amazing whenever, you know, the voices or whatever start speaking to you, you get confused. And I say, you know what? I'll just get on my knees. And I hit my knees and, and simply there beside that bed, I said, Lord, I, I just, I don't even know what to pray. I just, I got on my knees. I said, Lord, I, this is the first thing that came to my mind as I've been reading in the book of uh, Second Kings. And I said, Lord, I want to be a willing vessel. There was a, a passage in there about being a willing vessel and, and bring me yet another vessel was the, the, the phrase that started the passage. And I said, Lord, I want to be a willing vessel. And all of a sudden, the, the Lord shut me up and said, do you really? I've told you what to do, and you won't do it. And God spoke to me in that moment, and I could have missed that incredible opportunity by not understanding it was the voice of God that wanted me to humble myself, hit my knees, and listen to him. I remember it like it was yesterday. I can remember times that God spoke to me so clearly that I knew that it was him. And the voice of God to us is a beautiful thing. If you've never, ever heard the voice of God, you can and you will today because his voice is also his word to us to be able to encourage us, equip us for every battle that the enemy is going to bring against us. And I want you to know that when the word comes to you, it will pierce you. It will, it will sharpen you. It's living. It will transform you. The word of the Lord comes to you, and it will speak to you in a very specific way, and it will change something in you, about you, so that you can move in a new direction. To be obedient to what he says, because every time he speaks, we have a choice. Every time he speaks, we have a choice. For the teaching that's going around to say when God speaks, you have no choice, that's not even biblical. Every time God spoke to an incredible man or woman of God throughout Scripture, they had a choice. Whether or not they were going to obey what God was saying or they were going to come up with an excuse for what God was saying. And it's the same for us. So the word of the Lord is going to come to us, and that's the good news. And the challenging news for many of us if we're taking notes, is that when God comes to us, he will often ask us to do things that we don't want to do. See, the first thing I want to point out today is that God's plan and our plan doesn't always match up. See, in Jonah chapter 1, verse 2, he says, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. Think of the most wicked place in America, in the world that you can think of. And then let's just imagine God speaks to you and says, I want you to go there and preach against it. See, when we read that, we're like, well, man, God said it. Why didn't Jonah do it? Why didn't he just obey? Why didn't he just go? It seems like if God said it, then it would work. Can I tell you that we have to look at what Nineveh represented and what Nineveh was for us to understand the history of why this happened. See, Nineveh was the capital of the Syrian Empire. And 
if you understand a little more about that, you understand why Jonah hated Nineveh. See, Nineveh was the capital city, and it was rumored that when Assyrians would be attacking a village, that they were so brutal in the way that they handled their captives that there were complete cities that committed suicide when the rumor of them attacking came to the village. That's how brutal they were. They would torture them and be so destructive. They would, they would, uh, they would capture them. Let me just tell you a little bit about it. In the history books, you can find this to be true in what they've documented, that when they would go in and take over a city, they would kill all sorts of people, and the surviving women, they would rape before they would kill them. They would rape the little girls. They would torture the kids, and they would take the husbands who were prisoners of war, and they would bury them up to their neck outside the city in the desert once they had skinned them alive. Can you imagine the pain? And they would take their tongues as they buried them up, and they would take their tongues, pull it out of their mouth, and they would drive a stake through their tongues into the ground. Brutal, evil, corrupt, wicked. Then they would behead the dead and build a pyramid to show that they had conquered the village. Sounds like a place we all want to go. No. No. And of all the places that God could have said to Jonah to go, God picked Nineveh. And Jonah's like, why? Because it's very much possible that family members of his, friends of his, have suffered at the hand of the Assyrians. They would, all of the miserable things they would do from taking their tongue. It was so crazy that they were dying of thirst in the middle of the desert and through the night, and then they would play a Justin Bieber song. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> they wouldn't. All of the things that have happened, and in this moment of, of this torture, they would torture them all the way up to when they were dead, and then they would make the mound. Why? And so God speaks to Jonah, and Jonah's pretty much saying, I don't want to go there. I hate these people. He justifies his hate because of the situation that he is in. He despised them, and God said, I want you to do something. And in his mind, he had a legitimate reason that he didn't want to obey God. Which brings us to number two. When God asks you to do something that doesn't always make sense to you, can I tell you that whenever that opportunity comes, that you can always find a boat going in the opposite direction. When God speaks to you to do something, you can always find a way to go the opposite direction. Here's what it says in verse 3. It says, But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed to Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. And after paying the ferry, he went aboard, and he sailed for there to flee from God. God said basically to Jonah, up to this point, Go east to Nineveh. And what did Jonah say? Nope. Not going to do it. You said go east. I'm going to go west, young man. I'm going to load this boat, and I'm going to go 2,500 miles in the opposite direction. It's important that you know the distance between because it's documented that it would take a full year of sailing to reach the city he was headed for. Can I tell you the confusing part about going the opposite direction? is that in, a, in, in the midst of your running, in the midst of my running from what God has called me to do, there are times that we're confused because when we're on the boat and it seems sunny and 70, that, it, man, this must be God's will too. Can I tell you that maybe today you know in your heart that you've been running and you're a long way from God, or maybe today you're not running, but you may be drifting. Let us not confuse sunny and 70 with the will of God. Because you can go the opposite direction and seem like you're not hurting anyone around you and everything's good and everything's going fine and you're going to be okay because nothing bad's happening to you. Can I tell you, the enemy will always give you enough rope to hang yourself. He will throw you out there and go, oh, you're fine. I mean, God said go to it. But you know what? There, you know what? There's people in, in, at that port that need Jesus too. 
So let's don't get confused with the details. Let's just keep the big picture, the big picture. But when God speaks to you very specifically, you've got, you have, we, we have a choice. And Jonah chose to go the opposite direction. Why? Because if he stood up in front of the Ninevites and preached this message, they could very likely kill him for what he said. He would become a martyr. Now, there's not many people walking around today that say, man, I'm willing to be a martyr for Christ. They say it, but whenever the proof is, when when it's time to really ante up, they may not be all in. Jonah is a prophet to the northern kingdom of Israel under the rule of Jeroboam II, a man of God, not a fair weather follower, has this incredible call to go, and he goes the complete opposite direction. Can you imagine sitting on the boat and all of a sudden going, man, it looks good. It feels good. I'm not hurting anybody. I'm the only one that knows. We cannot confuse comfort with God's plan. Comfort does not always equivocate God's plan in our life. Because if it does, then there's a whole lot of people in this word he owes an apology to. But it may not mean that where you are is supposed to be torture all the time because when God calls you to go somewhere, even if in the eyes of people it looks horrible, in the eyes of God and what He can give you through the Holy Spirit can make you feel the peace of God that passes all understanding. And what he didn't realize is God had prepared the city for the word He had given him. And God was just looking for a preacher that played the part. Can I tell you that every one of us, under the sound of my voice, is called to ministry. We are called to be the voice to a generation, to a people that need Him. We are called to that. And when we do not answer that call, we are out of the will of God for our lives. The gospel of Jesus Christ is not a self-help book to make you have things. It is a transformational moment in your life where all these things will be added to you whenever you seek His kingdom first. It's a perception that changes everything about the way you see life, the way you do life, and the way you think about it. It's not just so you can have a great marriage. It's so you can have a whole marriage. That whenever you argue, whenever you fight, that you've got some substance to come back to because you know that God has blessed you for an opportunity to be in covenant with your spouse. That when all hell breaks loose in your life, that it doesn't mean you're out of the will of God. It could mean you're right in the middle of the will of God for your life because the enemy will fight people going the opposite direction that he desires for you to go. When people tell me, Pastor, the devil ain't fighting me. Sometimes I want to ask, maybe it's because you're going the same direction. Jonah faced no opposition in the beginning. He faced no opposition in the beginning. Do not confuse Sonny and 70 with the will of God. I remember talking with an individual. We were having, uh, I'd ask him to lunch because God had spoken to me through a dream about him. Now, there are sometimes I have dreams that are very on point. There are sometimes I have dreams just because I ate weird. All right? So I'm not this guy like, oh, I dream dreams all the time. And if we go to lunch, I'm going to tell you about a dream I had. And God's going, it's a very sovereign thing when this happens. It's happened twice in my life, and this is one of the two times. And God, through this this dream, had spoke to me and said, you need to get with him, and you need to challenge him because he's being unfaithful to his wife. Now, how many of you know that makes for a weird lunch? So what do you do when you got to share a message like that? You go to a Chinese buffet. So that way you got something peaceful happening before. We're chowing down, we're talking, and and I start small talk. I'm like, man, how's it? You know, you can always talk about the Cowboys. This guy has lovers and haters, and and it's, man, Cowboys, it wasn't even football season. I'm like, man, we play softball. We just kind of hobbied around, and and I said, look, because I found that the only way to get into it is just to dive head first, sink or swim. Here we go. Man, God spoke to me and told me, to me, and he goes, oh, man, I, I appreciate it. It's amazing whenever you call someone out, and if it's accurate, the way they respond. They back away. Now, you got to remember, this wasn't an option where I was saying, I wonder if this is true. This was a God had said moment. This is, I don't do this very often, and so this was a God, had, God said moment for him. 
He's like, oh, pastor, you know, my marriage is stronger than it's ever been. It's actually doing better now that we're not faithful to church. Okay. Yeah, I mean, we were fighting all the time going to church. We were fighting all the time because homeboy wouldn't get up and help get the kids ready. But again, that's, that's another church. That never happens here. And, and, he's, and, he, and he says, man, we've been fighting. We were, when we was coming to church, it seemed like we fight. Now that we're not faithful to church, everything's going good. And I said, well, man, I'm just telling you, I don't think that this was like a heed the warning type thing. Two weeks to the day, he was busted on a roller coaster in central Arkansas from northwest Louisiana with his mistress. Can I tell you that sunny and 70 doesn't always mean it's God's will? The opportunity that the word of the Lord gave to him that day was to spare his marriage so that his kids didn't have to grow up the way that they've grown up. But when you're hard-headed, how many of you know it's hard to combat ignorance and stupidity? In his mind, he was tired of fighting the fight and would rather go the way of the world instead of live counterintuitive of the world. Don't confuse Sonny and 70, because let me tell you what will happen. Number three is God will send a storm to get your attention. Here's what it says in verse 4. It says, Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to be broken up. Can you imagine when all hell's breaking loose, and in your mind you know you're the reason? You know you're the re- You know that everything's going south because of your disobedience. Up to this point, Jonah didn't introduce himself as the prophet of the Lord. Man, let me sell you guys. I'm a prophet of the Lord. I'm a Hebrew. But whenever the storm came, here's what he said in verses 8 through 10. He answered them and said, I am a Hebrew and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven who made the sea and the land. This disobedient sucker now is God's faithful servant when the storm came. But again, we don't know anybody like that. This is just a good story. I mean, because we've never, ever gone the opposite direction of what God desires for our life. And then whenever tragedy hits, we don't start crying out, no, I am a child of God. I mean, I ain't been walking with him, but now that all hell's breaking loose, now I am greater is he that is in me. We want to quote power scriptures for a life that we haven't been living. Oh, don't don't help me when I'm preaching this morning. Don't help me when I'm preaching this morning. Is, oh, well, that's right. No, no, no. I'm talking to all of us because here's the danger. Here is the danger. That there was no distinction between the people on the boat and the prophet of God. See, for us, it means that there's a possibility that the person that lives next door to us doesn't know Christ at all. And we've made Christianity a cultural Christianity in name only. It's a consumeristic religion. It is, well, as long as God does good things for me and I go to church every now and again or something, I, I might bless the meal. I, I, you know, I, hopefully I go to heaven and, 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 and they'll give me a promotion. And if I get sick, I'll go to him and ask him to heal me or heal somebody that I love. But there's really nothing in our daily life that resembles the teaching of Jesus in Scripture. But when it happens, we go, oh, yeah, I, I worship God. I, I, oh, yeah, I, I worship God. God, I'm 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 a follower of Jesus. Let me tell you something. Just because you're in church does not mean you worship God. And worshiping God is not something you do for an hour a week. It's a lifestyle. I worship God. Then I go home. I can't say, uh, well, well, I worship God. Then I'm going to go home and scream and yell at my family and be an absolute tyrant. What? Oh, Oh, yeah, I worship God. But I I like to use his name in vain when I hit a slice at my golf. Oh, I I worship God, but I like to get drunk a little. But again, I'm not talking to y'all, I'm talking about in America. It's time that we get back to the grassroots, the simplistic method of, oh, I'm a worshiper of Jesus, but I don't really live like it all the time. How many people would be shocked if you came out And said, I'm a worshiper of God. I can tell you stories. I don't tell people I'm a pastor when I first meet them. If I meet them out golf course or whatever. Because 
I want, to be every, I want to be who I am everywhere I go. And if who I am needs to change, I want the power of the Holy Spirit to transform me through the conviction of the Holy Spirit. That's what I desire, for God to speak to me and say, hey, Biggin, you got to change. I want that. He uses it through mentors, through his word, through prayer and opportunity. So when I go out, I'm not like, hey, I'm the pastor at Celebration. I want, I want them to take their mask off and let me see who they really are. And sometimes I'll be an hour, two hour into hanging out with them, and they've been bomb dropping, talking about all, running around on their watch. And I'm like, wow. And they go, so what do you do for a living? Like, my pastor? And Fairhope, like, oh. <laughs> yeah, I'm in, uh, I'm in leadership at so and so church. And I'm like, really? <laughs> well, judge me, lest you be judged. You can't tell me about the way I live. No, 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 no. We're talking about fruit inspection. Does how you live honor the one you say you worship? See, so he's either Lord of everything or he's not Lord at all. And this time in, in Jonah's life, he was thinking. Man, I'm a prophet, and I'm going the opposite direction, but things are good. But now that the storm hits, see, up to that moment, he was thinking that his private rebellion wasn't hurting anybody else. And there are times that we think the private rebellion going on in our life isn't going to affect anyone else. But I can promise you, private rebellion always has a public manifestation. Always. This thing on this that God has said, you need to follow me. You need to do this. But this private, well, things are going, I don't, I don't, you know how many people say, man, if I surrender everything to God, he's going to call me to go to Africa. And? Man, if I follow God, man, I'm going to have to give up these things I like. You won't have to, look, you don't give up anything. You give up nothing and gain everything. It's not this you know, people, it's almost, and again, this is a soapbox. I'm going to build it real big and stand on it here for a minute. I can't stand when people tell me, man, Pastor, if I gave everything to Jesus, he could really use me. I'm like, you think God's hard up for talent? The best throats God ever made that won more Grammys than nine normal people came through the church. Think the church is hard up for talent? Church ain't hard up for talent. The church is hard up for character. There's been a lot of figures staying on platforms that couldn't keep their pants up. There's been a lot of talent. God's not, oh, if I give everything to Jesus, he can you No, know, God isn't hard up for your talent. He's hard up for character. And when you have the mentality, God can do a lot with you, that's pride. And pride comes before a fall. You say, well, I would rather hear, man, I just, I've been living a life I know doesn't honor him, and I just, I'm going to give everything to him, follow him with everything that I have. It's the beauty of humility. Man, if I gave everything to Jesus, he could do a lot. With, mm, that's where you're wrong. God doesn't need you, but he chooses to use you. Based on your response, man, I can do a lot of good things. I can, no, 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 he can do a lot of good things through you. And here's what happens to Jonah. You can see it in verse 12. As Jonah comes to realization, this is my fault. I'm hurting all these innocent people by my disobedience to God. And he finally owns up to it. Can I tell you, all of us have to have a moment where we own up to the disobedience in our life. And in verse 12, he says, Pick me up and throw me into the sea, and it will become calm, because I know that it is my fault and that this great storm has come upon you because of me. Now, the beautiful part of it is this. Is that your worst day may be exactly what you need. Jonah's worst day was exactly what he needed. He was thrown overboard, and him being thrown overboard caused these men to have a worship moment. The raging sea grew calm, and the men feared the Lord. And verses 15, 16, and 17 tells us the story. But what did the Lord do on his worst day? It says, but the Lord provided a great fish. One more time, what did God do? He provided. On the worst day, God provided. He provided a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was inside the fish for three days and three nights. God provided a fish. And what Jonah would see as the worst possible scenario, God provided. And right now, we may be facing what some of us consider the worst nightmare of our life. 
I mean, financially, you may think it's over. I'm done. You, you may feel like in your relationships it's over. It's done. But do I have your attention right now to say the biggest storm you've ever faced may be an opportunity for God to provide in that moment? That when He has your attention, He can come through in a minute. It, 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 God can just step into the equation and solve the problem. God has, God will, and He will always, past, present, future when you say i'm done it's over when you reach the end of your rope you're at the right place to let go and grab on to him and god says now do i have your attention today as we get ready to close i want to want you to walk away understanding that when we disobey there will always be consequences think about it parents when your kids When your kids disobey you, do you go, ah, I didn't mean it anyway. I I told them to clean their room, but they don't have to. Look, if you tell them to clean their room and you still let them go play, that's your fault. You either have rules or you don't have them at all. There's always a consequence to disobedience. Now, I'm not saying you should cut, you know, like take a finger or body slam or tase them but if it worked no I'm kidding there's always consequence to disobedience see in his mind Jonah had legitimate reasons for not wanting to preach to the Ninevites let me ask you when is a time that you disobeyed God's direction for your life when's a time when you disobeyed what God said to you like not me pastor I've always obeyed well you should write a book on obedience and sell it when was a time where God through the power of the Holy Spirit put his finger on something in your life and said you need to do business with this issue he was like "Ah, I'll ignore it because I'm not hurting anybody else your delayed obedience is no obedience at all Well, one day I'm going to get this right. No, 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 no. Now is the moment. Now is the moment. Then I want to ask you this question. What has God used in your past? Or what is God using in your present to get your attention? Look, the mercy of God is so rich in the book of Jonah, especially in the beginning. The mercy of God is that he provided a fish. Now, can I tell you, there's nothing really great about living in the belly of a fish. A lot of people say it's a whale. I don't care if it was a whale or just a bit. I don't care if it was a triple tail. I don't care what it was. A giant snapper. I don't care if it was a great white. He was in the belly of a big old fish. That's what it says. And he lived there three days and three nights, and it wasn't a condominium that was like the Hilton. Sometimes in the belly is the worst place you can be, but being in the worst place you can be can be the best opportunity for God to work in your life. What will or what has God used in your past or your present to get your attention? When you think about it, you think about this in your mind, and I pray that the Holy Spirit will begin to speak to you. See, the word of the Lord is going forward today. And now it is our chance to respond. I want you to stand with me as we close.